We've never done a case like this before. This case had so many people involved and so many moving pieces that I'm still confused. If you can keep up, then you're amazing. It's time to listen to a real life telenovela with the case of Dora Cisneros right now on Love and Murder. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Love and Murder, the weekly true crime podcast discussing relationships gone terribly wrong. And when I say terribly wrong, how wrong do I mean? And it's at this moment that Char usually says, dead wrong, Kai, dead wrong, because that's what Char sounds like. However, Char is not joining us tonight. I am your host, Kai. And like I said, our gorgeous co-host, Char, is not here. She's actually sick with COVID. She was able to do a bonus episode yesterday. So if you want to see our bonus episodes or if you want to hear our bonus bonus episodes, you know where to go. Patreon.com forward slash love and murder. However, today she's feeling really under the weather, really tired, really sluggish and I mean, I'm not going to force her to do an episode, so it's just you and I tonight. So here we go. Our show discusses true crime cases told in the form of a story with mystery, suspense, and just a little bit of humor sprinkled on top. But as I always say, it is never, ever, ever at the expense of the victim. And if you actually listen to our show, you know that we never, ever, ever laugh at the victim. Download Good Pods and subscribe to Love and Murder over there as well as check out other indie podcasts. Good Pods is good for iOS and Android, so no matter what you have, you can listen on the go. Tonight, we're talking about, I really don't want to give away like anything about it because when you hear this story, you're going to be like, huh? It is one of the weirdest most I, I can't even understand type of cases we're going to give you. Well, I say where, but I'm going to give you tonight. It's a love triangle, but it's a triangle without the love. And I don't know, they were drawing it and turned it into a circle. I don't even know. It's the weirdest case. Just wait. But first, I'm going to give you my weekly reminder to listen to our last episode, The Case of Cindy Reese, number 59. And actually, we missed last week. So this episode from was from week before, but we missed last week because Shar had COVID and I didn't want her to record. So last episode, which was episode 59, was the case of Cindy Reese. And it was an insane case, but the trial was even more insane. And basically, it's a small town where everyone knows each other. And fries played a big part of the outcome of the case. So go ahead and listen to the to to cold fries, the case of Cindy Reese, episode number 59. And in our exclusive community, we're doing the countdown to the end of our summer sale. So go ahead and join now. We have so many bonuses going on in there right now. And with the summer sale, you will get access to all the bonuses for only half the price. So go ahead and go to www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder. You're going to choose much thanks secret tier and you will get in at only $5 a month, which is only 50% off of the normal price of this. You get all the bonuses we offer crazy true crime bonus episodes, relationship questions and answers, getting to know the host, ad free regular episodes. So you don't even get this beginning. You don't get you get straight into the case behind the scene content, love obsession, serial killer corner and random shows that I just put out because I feel like putting out putting them out. Uh, right now, we just did it. Getting to know the host episode week before everybody in the group was just I just put out a plethora of bonuses. And I actually have a random bonus that I'm about to put out this weekend. That's not even included. It's just extra. So if you want to be part of that, you want to get more content from us, then head on over to patreon.com forward slash love and murder and join the much thanks secret tier in 10 days that tear is going to disappear from public view and the price will go back up. So now is the time to do this. Today is day 10, so we're counting down. Also to make it easy on you, the link to the secret tear is in the show notes below. So all you have to do is click on it and subscribe. Now on to the show. 
Albert Joseph Fisher Jr., a.k.a. Joey, was born in Brownsville, Texas on January 16, 1975 to A.J. Buddy Fisher and Corrine Nelson. Unfortunately, A.J. and Corrine divorced when Joey was 12 and later went on to marry separate partners. Joey lived with his mom and his stepfather, who his stepfather's name was Bo Nelson. He was actually described as a very smart boy, making honor roll in high school and ranking 11th in his old overall class. That's impressive. He also spoke my second language, which is sarcasm, and loved to make people laugh. When he graduated from high school, he would be going to the honors program at the University of Texas in Austin in hopes of becoming an engineer. Again, impressive. While he was in 11th grade, he dated a girl named Christina. Christina Cisneros was born in 1976 to mother Dora Cisneros and father Dr. David Cisneros. She was one of five kids and was described as a quiet girl, but that didn't mean she didn't come alive when people she knew was around, which is usually how shy people are. I can attest to that. You think I'm not shy because I run a podcast, but if you meet me in real life, you'll see that's different. Christina's mom really liked Joey and she liked that her daughter was with him. I mean, he's an A student. He's 11th in his class. He has hopes. He has dreams. Who wouldn't? She thought that he was a really good kid, an academic achiever, and a good candidate for husband material for her daughter. Now, Doris Cisnero was born in 1938 in Los Indios, Texas, to a rich ranching family. She went from rich to rich when she married a surgeon from Brownsville, Texas. She was well-respected in the area, volunteered in the medical community, helped raise funds for the medical scholarships, and was the president of the Southern Chapter of the Cameron Wilsey County's Medical Society. Sounds like an amazing wife and mother to me. But back to the kids. Joey and Christina spent a lot of time together, mainly outdoors. Joey gave Christina a ring to solidify their relationship. And then during spring break, they went to South Padre Island and had sex at Christina's parents' condo. However, afterwards, Joey ended up regretting doing this. But then Christina denied that it even ever happened, which is weird. But okay, their relationship persevered as young love usually does. And they even ended up going to prom together like the next year. To Christina, things were looking up. But then in June of 1992, Joey decided that he didn't want to move forward and he ended the relationship. He felt like there were no emotions involved in the relationship. And according to him, he was looking for more of a connection. After they broke up, remember that ring he gave her? Well, he wanted it back. But Christina was like, no, it's mine. You know, and she felt heartbroken that he broke up with her because she wasn't ready to let go of the relationship. So she felt heartbroken. So she didn't want to give back his ring. I guess she figured like this is a part of him that she could keep. Or maybe if she did keep it, he'd come around more, you know, just irrational thought process to just try and get the person that you love back in your life. I have a question. I was just wondering this. Do y'all have any stories of items given to you by someone? It could be anyone, just a friend, anyone. But then y'all had a fight and they wanted it back. Did y'all give it back? Let me know in the comments below what what you did. Did you give it back? Did you keep it? And why did you keep it if you did keep it? Now, after Christina told her mom that Joey broke up with her, interestingly enough, and I use the word interesting very loosely, what I really want to say is insanely enough, Dora took this hard and started calling Joey. Now, wait, just what? Like, I'm wondering, would you ever do that for your child? If somebody left your child, would you start calling the person like, take my child back, please, they miss you. Would you do that? As a matter of fact, she didn't just call him once. She called him continuously, basically demanding the reason why he broke up with her daughter. Like, why'd you leave her? She loved you. Y'all were good together. Y'all were going to have a great future, which, to be honest, would push anybody guy or girl would push them either even further away because dude your mom's crazy stay away from me but joey was a different person than i am so he actually explained to dora that you know ma'am christina is a really good girl she's really nice she's you know anybody would be lucky to be with her but 
I just don't feel like being in a relationship right now. I kind of just want to be by myself and have the option to talk to other girls if I wanted to. You know, basically, he didn't want to cheat on her or treat her badly, you know. But do you think that was enough for Dora? Like, she's the adult here. Do you think that information was enough for her? No. She ended up calling Joey's father, his father, not even his stepfather. She called his father and was like, hey, man, um, I know we don't know each other and we probably have never spoken and you probably have no freaking clue who I am. I also know Joey doesn't live with you, so you might know what's going on, but maybe not. Who knows? Anyways, with that out of the way, your son broke up with my daughter and I want to know why. Can you call him and ask him, text him, whatever? It's 92. I don't think we know what texting is yet or cell phones. Yeah. But anyways, (laughs) find out why he broke up with my daughter. Could you do that for me? Person that you've never met before. Can you can you do that for me? So Joey's father was like, look, lady, stop calling here. I, I don't know why my son broke up with your daughter, but clearly I could see why he shouldn't come back and just, you know. That was it. But something else was an issue. Joey really, really wanted his ring back. And Christina really, really didn't want to give that ring back. So Joey actually wrote a letter to Christina saying that, look, I want my ring back. I gave it to you in good faith that, you know, either we're going to be together or obviously, you know, we're not together. So you would give it back to me because it's not yours. So I really want this ring back. It really means a lot to me. So I'm going to give you like 10 days to give this ring back to me, or I'm going to take quote action. I don't know what the action is, but he just said he would take action. So he wrote this letter and sent it to her. And when Christina got the letter, you know, she read it. She probably cried like her little heart out because, you know, she, she loved Joey and just seeing this letter is more solidifying that they're not together. Dora then takes the letter and calls Joey's father again And she was like, hey, me again, the stranger that you have no idea who it is. But your son wrote my daughter a letter that he wants his ring back. And, you know, why don't we come meet, talk about this ring? You know, I could see if I can get Christina to give the ring back and I can irrationally talk to you about why your son left my daughter. And maybe we can come together and figure out a way to smush them back together because that sir, is how children work. So for some reason, Joey's dad agreed to meet her at Burger King. And they went on over to Burger King to talk about, quote, the ring. Joey's father sits down and he's like, okay, you know, I'm here for the ring. Can you give it to me? And she's like, oh, wait, I I don't, I don't have the ring. I did come to talk to you about something very, very important to me and very, very dear to my heart, complete stranger who I don't know. Um... I don't know if I asked this before, but if I didn't ask it before, uh, I'm going to ask it now. Uh, I just want to know, hmm, why did your son break up with my daughter? (laughs) Like, oh my God. Do you ever wonder what would happen if, well, if... If you give a dad a podcast. I'm what you call a nerdy fan. I nerd out at this stuff, hardcore. You'll hear me talk about anime on here. You'll hear me talk about Power Rangers. You'll hear me talk about wrestling on here. Okay. I had an axe handle with a twisted T on it. <laughs> it right after that <laughs> twisted T video went viral. And man, they went out and grabbed it and smacked the dude in the head with it. It was so... That's great. That's- I'd like to think of this podcast as a nostalgia moment for me. It's a show where I can talk about whatever I want. I'm a, I'm a human and I'm a chiropractor. There was a picture of me. It looked like I was on the side of a ramen box over in China. But... <laughs> so I took my kids with me to Comic-Con. I thought that was really cool. Well, I don't know if my wife should listen to this podcast. We'll cut that part out. <laughs> oh, you hope? I'll be like, and then Robert said this. <laughs> if you give a dad a podcast, available now on all podcasting platforms. And Joey's dad was like, what? I came, I, I came here for the ring. To, okay, look, let me just lay this out for you. Whatever happened between your daughter and my son is between your daughter and my son. 
I don't know why he broke up with her. That is his business. He told your daughter, I'm pretty sure he gave her his excuse, whether it was true, false, whatever. He gave her his excuse as to why they broke up. Your daughter needs to accept it. And she's like, oh, no, no, my daughter accepts it. I don't accept it. I don't accept it. And, and, you know, Joey's father was like, well, my son's old enough to make his own decisions. Even if I tried to make a decision for him, what did you do when your parent tried to make a decision for you at 17? Did you just easily go along with that decision? No? Well, okay. He made his decision. There's a reason he made this decision and I'm not getting involved. That's it. They broke up. Leave it alone. Then Dora was like, well, do you know that Joey drinks? And his dad was like, Okay, I'm pretty sure, you know, a lot of teenagers do this. This is what his dad said. I'm pretty sure a lot of teenagers do it. So, yeah. And she was like, well, I saw him drunk one time. And he was like, okay, well, if he's ever been drunk, it's never been when he's around me. But I'll I'll talk to him, you know, maybe don't get drunk, act more of a gentleman, be better. I I don't really know what you want from this conversation, but I I totally came here for the ring and you don't have the ring. So I don't know. My, my son said 10 days, like this is like day nine or eight or something. So I don't know what you want me to do. And then she was like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get the ring to you. I'll, I'll, I'll convince my daughter to give you the ring and we'll get this together. I I apologize for asking this question again, but, um, you know, we'll get the ring and I'll give it to you. So then when Joey's father is left, he calls Joey and he's like, look, I don't know what happened between you and this Christina girl, but I want you to call her. And if you've ever offended her, just apologize to her. Just just can we just cut clean ties, please? Because I don't know what's going on. This mother keeps calling me. She showed up saying she was going to give me a ring, but she came asking me, why would you break up with her daughter or whatever? So if you ever offended or was mean to Christina, please give her a call and just apologize to her. So it was never clarified if he actually did do this, which if I were him, I wouldn't because like, I didn't do anything. I mean, I understand where his father's coming from. He's just trying to get this crazy woman from calling uh, to stop calling. But Joey actually knows what happened. You know what I'm saying? And if there was no reason for him to call her to apologize, then he probably didn't. As opposed to if he did, then he maybe did. As opposed to he's a teenager and good Lord, leave it alone. But even so, after all of this, do you know that Dora still kept calling him? Like, woman, give it a rest. Like, even one time she called him and she was like, look, Joey, my daughter loves you very, very much. I don't know why y'all broke up. I think I personally think that y'all should get back together. How much you want to bet that Christina had already moved on and she was like, she had gone through the depression and the crying phase and everything like that. And she was just like, okay, I accept it now. And her mom was the one still on this. But anyways, she was like, look, if you get back with Christina, I'll give you $500, like 500, like that's one, two, three, four, five, 500. I'll give you this if you get back with my daughter. And Joey was like, what the, f- no, I, I don't, I don't want your money and I don't want your daughter. No, we broke up. Like, I don't understand how to get this through your head. We broke up. I don't want to be with your daughter. And after all of this, like she kept calling, she kept calling, she kept pestering him, kept hounding him, blah, blah, blah. Get back with her, get back with her. So one day he couldn't take it anymore. And he was like, look, stop, stop just stop calling me. So senior year rolls around for him and he starts dating a new girl. They went to the homecoming dance together and everything like that. And around the same time, see, like I said, Christina had moved on. She started dating another boy. They both just moved on. But apparently her mom just, I don't know why, I don't know what is going on with her. But even though the kids moved on, she, she couldn't move on. On the morning of Wednesday, March 3rd, 1993, at around 7 a.m., Corrine, which is Joey's mom, heard a noise while she was upstairs in her bedroom. To her, it sounded like a branch breaking or like someone's car backfiring 
or even just weirdly like fireworks, like just somebody setting off just one firework. And she looked out the window to see what was going on. And she actually didn't end up seeing her car in the driveway. She didn't see anything out of the ordinary. So being that it was 7 a.m., Joey usually doesn't leave at that time, but she thought maybe he went to the store to go pick up something for lunch or something for school. But Joey's brother was like, no, I see the car in the driveway. It's like literally right there. So she was like, okay, that's weird. So she ran downstairs and went to the garage. And so you know how you open the garage and you can walk through the garage and you're out into the driveway. So she did that. And then she saw something no parent ever wants to see. She saw her son, Joey, lying face up in the driveway, just bleeding and staring at the sky. So she started freaking out and she told her daughter to call 911 and to call their father, like because their father only lived like a little while away. So it was like, call 911, call dad, call when they called their father, you know, he ran over. He who's going to stop? I wouldn't even get dressed. I run over as he's getting to the house. He's hearing police sirens getting to the house as well. He's hearing it getting closer and closer as he's getting to the house. I mean, can you imagine that as a parent, you get this call, your daughter's telling you, you know, your son's been shot. He actually took a bunch of uh, shortcuts to get to the house. And instead of going through the entrance for the subdivision, he just cut through the trees. He was like, screw that. He just cut through the trees, which I completely dig. I'd have done the same thing. And he said he was driving like 110 miles an hour or for our non-American listener listeners, 180 kilometers an hour. And like I said, as he's getting closer to the house, he's hearing sirens getting closer to the house. So as a parent, that's going to make you panic even more because, you know, this isn't a drill. This isn't like something that uh, your ex-wife is making up. This isn't April Fool's or whatever. You know, this is something that's real. The sirens are getting closer, just like you're getting closer. So when he got to the house, He jumps out of his car and he sees Joey's body lying on the ground face up and he's holding a garden hose. The garden hose was still running, which means it was mixing with his blood. And so by this time, the entire driveway and the road leading up to the house and everything like that was just blood. So like it made it look even worse. You know what I'm saying? So it was just blood everywhere. So when cops arrived, they're getting the situation together and obviously they're starting the investigation. Had anybody seen anything? So Joey's brother, Eric, actually said he saw a short Latino guy who looked like in his mid 20s with a beard driving a white four door car with Mexican license plate speeding away, just speeding away from his house. That is like the most obvious you don't have an american license plate it's completely white that's like driving up somewhere with a yellow or a red car and then doing something and it's that that is the most i just (laughs) i don't understand criminals that is the most obvious obvious thing ever so then they started calling around trying to see well who has something out for my son? Like what's going on? Who would shoot him? And so they called around to his friends and everything like that and nobody knew anybody who disliked Joey like everybody liked Joey like even his ex-girlfriend liked Joey so they couldn't think of who would do this to him like are you crazy really this happened are you serious and then one person thought of something he said oh wait Joey had been in an altercation I won't say fight but an altercation with a group of boys at a football game so maybe that so that's like the only thing they had to go off of So with the police looking at the body, they noticed that he had been shot twice at point blank range and one was in his chest and the other was in his head. So he was shot like execution style. So after all of this happened, the day wore on, they cleaned everything up, police came and went and the family was left to deal with the aftermath, which I couldn't even imagine They got everything together and they buried Joey. Uh, It doesn't really tell the time as when when he was buried. So I can't give you that time frame. But 
The reason I bring this up is because they decided to have an open casket to let everybody go ahead and see Joey. Um, His schoolmates came. His parents, friends and acquaintances came. His girlfriend came and her mother, Christina, came, but her mother didn't come. After he was buried, his his family just couldn't take living in that house. So they very quickly moved out of the house and went to live with Corrine's mom. And later on, they ended up selling the house and they actually lost money on the house, but they didn't care. They just they just wanted the house gone. The police had actually put out a reward for any information about who was involved in this this murder. The reward started out at $5,000 and then it went up to $20,000, but still they had no leads. Interestingly enough, the day of the murder, investigators did discover a tennis shoe print near the air conditioning unit outside of the house. And right next to Joey's body, they did find a yellow business card. But the business card was like, it had a lot of blood on it from his mom's hands while she was trying to stop the bleeding. So at that time, they weren't able to read it. But as time went on and they continued with the investigation, they were able to figure out what the card said. And it said it was from the count. Collin County Bail Office in McKinney, Texas. And there was also a phone number printed on it. And in handwriting, there was an area code, which was 214, which is actually the Dallas area code. So of course, Sheriff Alex Perez took that number and went ahead and called the bail office and asked them to fax copies of bond applications made by the Rio Grande Valley residents. So basically what their thought process was, was that the person who did this dropped the card after Joey was trying to like defend himself. So what police officers are thinking is that the person who did this dropped the card, not that he had the card before, but the person who did this before he ran or in the whole scuffle and everything like that, he dropped the card. Once they got all of these applications, one stood out and it was this guy named Rudy Cellular, which is a guy who lives in Dallas, but he goes to Mexico a lot. So it kind of would stand to reason he would have a Mexico license plate. During all this time, tips are coming in left and right, left and right. You know, like any other murder investigation, everybody has seen something, everybody knows something, and they usually lead to a waste of time. So the police's theory right now was first they thought it was a drive-by shooting. Then they kind of fleshed it out and thought it was maybe a gang member who thought that Joey was probably somebody else. And then they carried out a a hit on him accidentally. And then based on tips, they had a lead suspect But when they brought this guy in, it all fell through it. It wasn't this guy. So that didn't work out. Then they got another tip that there was a car that was abandoned at the border of the U.S. and Mexico. And people were saying this sounds like the car that was used in the shooting. So they went and investigated that car. But that turned out to be a dead end as well. So with all of these rumors and all of these tips turning out to be dead ends, the one name they did have was that Rudy Cellar. So they went ahead and called the bail office again and asked them for Rudy's full name, his address in Dallas, and to resend his application. So when they were looking over his application, they noticed that his handwriting was kind of familiar, specifically the number four. The way it was written matched the number four on the card. Remember, it was a handwritten uh, area code 214 that was written on the card. So on his bill, his bill application, his four looked exactly like that four. So, of course, they went out and looked for him and they revoked his bond. And so he came up to the bail office trying to find out, like, why did you take away my bond? Like, what happened? And when he got there, police were there waiting for him and they scooped him up and started questioning him like, hey, look at this business card. Does this look familiar to you? 
And he was like, yeah, actually, he says somebody had given him this card at the La Quinta Motel in Brownsville and told him to call this number if he was already if he was ever arrested. So they were like, oh, really? And they went down to the motel that he was talking about. And this motel was actually a meeting place for like criminals, but like lower ended criminals. So they went down to the motel that he was talking about. And look through the records to see in the time between the murder and, you know, now and a little bit before who had been staying at this motel. So they started going through and investigating every single person who had been staying at this motel within this time frame. And also Rudy gave them the number of someone named Ramiro Moya which is a guy who lives in San Antonio, but he usually comes down to Brownsville. And he said this guy claims to know about the murder. So then (laughs) this is becoming a he said, he said, he said, he said, good Lord. So then Ramiro led police to his brother, well, half brother, whose name is Daniel Orlando Garza. And he (laughs) was a San Antonio painter who also went to Brownsville a lot and Mexico a lot. So a couple weeks later, so now we're like in the middle of March, police interrogated Daniel. And he said he actually had a landscaping business in Mexico. That's why he went between San Antonio and Mexico. But why Brownsville? So this is his, this is his, what he claims that I have a business in Mexico. So this is why we go between San Antonio and Mexico. But police didn't really buy that story. And they were more thinking he was a drug dealer. So they continued questioning him, just trying to see, you know, why? Give us the truth of why you go to Mexico. What were you doing in Brownsville? Why do you come to Brownsville a lot? You know, if you ha- if you're a painter in San Antonio, what's going on? Give us the papers for your landscaping business in Mexico. Show us proof that you have this business in Mexico. Why are you in Brownsville so much? So after a while of questioning, Daniel was like, you know what? <laughs> Screw this. I'm going to tell you everything. And he said that he made arrangements to have Joey killed. He said basically that after he separated from his wife in 92, he went to a local fortune teller. And he said the fortune teller, whose name was Maria Mercedes Martinez de Sanchez, forgive my accent, spoke with him like he went there several times. So for several sessions, he she spoke with him, trying to help him to fix his relationship with his estranged wife. He says that his son was born with muscular dystrophy. And because of all of this, his wife was depressed and she had always said that she wanted to kill herself. She was so depressed and she was, she felt bad for her son. So not only did she want to kill herself, but she wanted to kill her son. So he says, this is why he went to this fortune teller. And this is why he needed to be back in his wife's life, which makes no sense as to why Joey is involved in all of this. But let's find out. He also told them that he believes that his wife's relatives had cast some type of spell on their marriage. And this is also why he needed her help, Maria's help, to help him. This is what he says, break the spell. She said, so he, she was like, okay, I'll help you. But this is what you have to do. And this is what she said. If you help to kill Joey then I'll help you. And that's all the payment that you need to do. That's what she said. And so he was like, well, who is this kid? And she told him that I have a client, quote unquote, who wanted Joey and anyone else in the way dead. So if you do this for me, then I'll do this for you. So police are like trying to figure out, well, who is this person? Who is this client of Maria's? So they set up a whole sting operation and had Daniel reach out to Maria to say that the people he was hiring to kill Joey wanted more money. So she was like, okay, never mind. I'll, you know, come on, let's talk. Let's get the more, let's get the money just so we can get this done. So he wore a wire and everything like that. And in April of 93, he ended up meeting up with her three times. Finally, she agreed to contact her client and you will never guess who her client is. Dora, Christine's mom. I mean, what the, are you serious? This woman just really never got over the breakup. Like talk about tiger mom. I've never seen anything like this. All right. So anyway, so now that they know who the client is, they have to 
catch her, you know? They can't just say, oh, okay, this is the client. There's, there's no evidence there, there's no proof. So once they had proof from Maria that, you know, this is my client here, we're gonna contact my client to, so that Danielle could give her the money, police felt they had enough to arrest Maria. So on April 6th, she was arrested and she was like, no, 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 you don't understand. I don't know if you look at this shirt that I got from uh, Love and Murder podcast, even though I never knew I was going to be on here. But it says, look, I sing like a bird. So she was like, I'm going to work with you. I'm going to help you catch Dora. And so she was like, don't worry about it. I, I, I'll, I'll work this out so we can work something out because this face, I'm too pretty for prison. So the next morning, she called Dora and scheduled a meeting with her and told her that, yeah, they're going to carry out the hit but the assassins want more money. And so you need to pay more money for this to happen. So she got in the car with Dora and they rode around Brownsville. And while she was in the meeting, she was wearing a wire and everything. So while they were driving around, police drove close to them so that they can, you know, listen in on the transmitter. However, they kept, you know, coming in and out. So they only heard portions of the conversation and it was Basically, as they're hearing it, it's recording. So they're only able to record portions of the conversation. So while they were in the car together, Dora did give Maria more money. It was an envelope with $500 in it. So on the recording, you could hear Dora ask Maria if there was any evidence that she was the one behind the the murder. Then you also, because remember, it's choppy. So then you also hear uh, Dora mention Danielle's name and then somebody she called El Cortado, but they never found out who that was. Other than that, there was no incriminating evidence against the gunman. However, Dora had paid Maria $500 for a hit, so that's something that they could um, arrest her on. So instead of continuing to let them drive around or letting Dora get away or whatever, they ended up pulling over the car and they arrested Dora. And, you know, she was like, I don't understand why I'm being arrested for. I gave her money because I owed her some money. Maria was like, no, that's no, she doesn't owe me anything. <laughs> so Maria was singing like a bird. So both Dora and Maria were arrested and charged with capital murder, which Don't forget, this happened in Texas. Texas, Florida, look, there are some states that you just don't do stuff in. And so in Texas, capital murder gets a life sentence or death by lethal injection. So anyway, they took her to the jail, didn't give her bail. However, her attorney fought for her and said because she was a respected member of the Brownsville community, she deserved bail. So on April 13th, she was granted bail. She was released from prison on a $300,000 a $300, bond. And Maria actually ended up staying in prison. But the next day, she got a bond for $300,000 as well. Then on June 8th, 1993, Danielle was arrested at the Cameron County office when he surrendered after a arrest warrant was issued for him. He was also charged with capital murder and was held in the county prison for $500,000 bond. So while all this is happening, Maria's talking and she's talking about how she knows Dora. So she said Dora came and visited her at least three different times to talk to her about some type of breakup between her daughter and her daughter's ex-boyfriend. During the first meeting, Dora wanted to know if Joey felt anything for her daughter. Like, did he love her? Did he care about her? And Maria read through her cards, she says. And what she told Dora was that Joey was no longer in love with Christina. So Dora paid $5 for this card reading and just left the shop. She was just pissed off. Like, she didn't, this isn't what she wanted to hear. Then she came back a second time. And this time, Dora asked, Asked Maria to cast a spell on Joey and Maria was like I I can't do that I, I I don't what do you want from me so Dora got upset and left the store again then a couple days went by and Dora called Maria she called her store her little shop she called her shop and asked her hey this is what she said can you pray for Joey to get back with Christina so I guess Maria was like sure whatever and they hung up so then dora came back to the shop in october of 1992 and she was like hey look 
Do you know anybody that's open to beating up a kid? Like they have no morals at all. I guess they don't care. So they're open to beating up a, a good kid who's only about 17, 18. And Maria was like, no. So she was like, okay, okay, never mind. I was just asking for a friend anyway. So then she came back again. So I guess she did meet more than three times. I guess it said at least, right? So she met four times. So there's four meetings and a phone call so far. So she came back in the winter and she was like, you know, okay, remember when I asked you if anybody had no morals and they were willing to beat up an 18 year old kid? You know, I knew that was bad to ask. So... Okay, instead of that, I'm going to ask this. Instead of beating him up, do you know anybody that will just kill him? I'm willing to pay $3,000 to the person who would do it. This is what she said. And Maria was like, well, I don't know anybody that will beat up a kid. I'm not willing to put a spell on a kid. And I, I don't really know about this murder. But she's like, whoa, 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 wait, no, no, no. Maria, listen to me. This dude raped Christina and he's running around school telling classmates that, you know, this is what he did. He had sex with her. He raped her and everything like that. So I, I can't I can't have that for my daughter. So Maria was like, OK, so he's basically he raped your daughter and he's running around laughing about it. So she was like, OK, I'll see if I can find someone who can help you with this. And then that's when Maria talked to Daniel and Daniel said, yeah, I could try and find someone to help you with this. And then in the meantime, he kept calling her and trying to get her to help him with his marriage problems. And because we all know how persistent Dora is, sometimes when when Danielle was there talking about his wife and his kids and how are you going to help me with this and everything, she would stop him from talking like, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, I hear that. But did you find anybody to take care of this Joey kid yet? Because she just wanted, she wanted Dora off her back, you know? So she would just like interrupt him and be like, did you find anybody to take care of Joey yet? And then in November, Dora called Maria to say like, why has this not been taken care of yet? And Maria said, well, you're going to have to have patience. I don't know when this is going to happen. This is going through somebody else. So you're just going to have to wait. And then on January 4th, 1993, Danielle ended up divorcing his wife. So I guess the sessions didn't work out like he hoped it would. So he divorced his wife, but he kept calling Maria to be like, you didn't help me with anything. Like, what are you going to do? Help me with this. She left me. You told me you were going to help me. And she was like, well, you haven't done what I asked you to do yet. So then on January 9th, he actually went to Brownsville, drove from San Antonio to Brownsville. I wonder how long of a ride that is. Let's find out. So Brownsville, Texas to San Antonio, Texas. Good Lord, he was determined. That's four hours and 12 minutes, 277 and a half miles. Wow. Just to go to a tarot reader. That's wow. I don't know what's wrong with these people in this case, but wow. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, on January 9th, he traveled from San Antonio to Brownsville because he wanted to talk to Maria face to face about the divorce. And once again, even though this wasn't over the phone, Maria was like, look, my client wants Joey dead. When are you going to do this? You want me to fix your divorce? Then you got to do this for my client. She's like, that's the only way that your marriage problems will be solved. So then Danielle said, you know what? I do know, I do know two people who could do this. So Dora had given Maria a photo of Joey. So she passed that on to Danielle. And then Danielle Daniel contacted the two hitmen that he knew, Israel Ole Olivares Caveda, again, ignore my accent, and Heriberte Puentes Pizania. So these are the two hitmen that he knew. So these two guys were actually part of a drug trafficking ring that went between the U.S. and Mexico. And they also had a car, th a car theft ring that also went between Mexico to the U.S. So their car theft ring actually went from Mexico all the way up to Chicago. And then this whole organization, the drug trafficking and the car chef theft, was actually headed by none other than Rudy Cellular. Remember him? Remember the bond application that led back to this one name? Oh my God. So all of this was tied back to him with that. So on February 14th, Danielle met the two hitmen in Dallas 
to describe like the murder plans. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? This is the person. He actually gave them Joey's picture. He gave them the address of the house. He gave them the ma- a map with the address circled and everything like that. They said they would go ahead and do this on their next trip to Brownsville. They said, yeah, we got you. We got you. We'll go ahead and do this. Then on March 2nd, 1993, Danielle was traveling from San Fernando in Mexico back up to San Antonio and he ended up bumping into them at the motel in Brownsville. So I guess he stopped in Brownsville and they were sitting there and he was like, uh, everything's good to go. You're going to do this. What's up? And they were like, yeah, we're ready to do this. You know, everything's everything's good. We're ready to go. So this all came between talking to Maria and talking to Danielle. This all came out. Another piece of the story during the investigation, they looked at the U.S. border surveillance and they noticed that a Mercury, a white Mercury Grand Marquis with Mexican license plates had crossed the border at 6.39 p.m. on March 2nd. They also saw that this car had crossed into Brownsville about 18 times between August 1992 and March 1993. Then... Remember when they went to check at the motel, they checked the registry and they discovered that on 8.26 p.m. that evening, two guys named Puentes and Ramon, which were other hitmen in Rudy's organization, had checked in with the receptionist. She had registered this white car in her notebook, so it was there. You know, it was the white car was definitely in that area in that city the night before the murder. There was also more evidence to show that Danielle, along with the other two hitmen, visited a gun shop in Dallas to purchase a 38 Super Pistol, which was the exact caliber of gun that was used to murder Joey. And then after Joey was killed, Danielle had reported that his gun was stolen from his house in San Antonio. He said someone broke into his house and the only thing they took for some reason was my gun and police actually never found a gun. Then police also confirmed that between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. on March 3rd, Danielle was called at the motel to let him know that the murder was successful. Then after that, Danielle went to Maria's shop to tell her that the job is done and she told him that she wasn't going to give him money. She wasn't going to give him the money to pay the two assassins unless there was solid, complete proof that Joey was dead. So then he went back to the motel and spoke with the two assassins and they went ahead and called Maria themselves a couple hours later and said, no, the job is done. It's where we did it. I don't, we don't have a solid proof or anything, but I'm telling you based on our word, we did it. The word of a criminal. So then Maria told Dora. So Dora got to the store and, you know, she went into the, she went into Maria's store and acted like she was doing something. But when she left, she didn't leave with this envelope that she had in her hand. That She then went to her daughter's school to pick her daughter up from school. Then later that evening, the two hitmen met with Maria and picked up the envelope from her. Then after that, Danielle was picked up by his nephew, who his nephew took him to the airport, and then he flew back to San Antonio. The funny thing is, he said that on his way to the airport, he did pass through Rancho Viejo and did see, he remembers seeing police cars at a house, and the house was taped off with yellow tape. What a piece of scum. They asked how much money were they given, uh, did they give to the hitman, and uh, everybody had a different story. They said it was 3000 They said it was 3500 Police thinks it was like $5,000. So, of course, after all of this, good Lord, do you see how many people were involved in this? <gasps> Just going around the mulberry bush. So after all of this, arrest warrants were issued for the two hitmen, but they were believed to be in Mexico. So police started working with the Mexico, uh, Mexican officials to try and arrest the two men. On July 21st, 1993, Mexican State Judicial Police arrested both of the hitmen and an extra person, Alonzo, I don't know how to say their name, Israel and his brother, which his brother had nothing to do with uh, Joey, but he did have something to do with a 1992 murder charge and use of an author- unauthorized vehicle. 
So they were arrested, but they were released around 3 a.m. the next day after Israel showed the police a writ of habeas corpus, which protected his constitutional rights. So Brownsville police were told about this. And basically the only thing they could do was be like, well, if they cross the border again, they'll be arrested. On February 13th, 1994, state ju judicial police arrested Puentes on a car theft charge. But in an interview the following day, he said that, you know, I didn't, I don't know any Joey. I, I didn't kill Joey. And, you know, oh, where was I on that day? I was actually at my mom's house in Matamoros. And also, neither me nor Israel are gun owners or gun users. We just don't believe in guns. It's just, no, guns are bad. So now everybody's been arrested, still in jail, out on bond, out on bail, out on Kool-Aid, whatever. So on July 28th, 1993, a grand jury indicted everybody. Israel, Maria, Garza, Ola Olivares, Fuentes, everybody, just everybody. The defense attorneys wanted to move the trial out of Cameron County because, of course, this case has now, you know, got a lot of attention. It's been on the news. It's, everybody knows about it. So he kind of wanted to get it out of a place that it wasn't so popular in. And I use that term popular very loosely. He also wanted to have his client, Dora, tried separately from everybody else. And he wanted to suppress a statement that was made by Maria after she was arrested. So on August 12th, Dora and Martinez pled not guilty to murder charges. I wish I had I had a uh, Shar here so she could say they pled what Shar? Not guilty to murder charges. And after everybody ran around saying they weren't guilty, pre-trial motions were set for October 7th and the trial was set for November 8th. So while waiting for all of that, attorneys are just filing motion after motion after motion after motion. They wanted to suppress statements that their clients had made since they were arrested in March. Maria's attorney said that, you know, she didn't understand that she had a right to have an attorney because she wasn't fluent in English. So they wanted, I guess, that waived whatever. She, they said her arrest was unlawful. So they wanted to reverse that. They also asked the judge to, you know, discard the wiretappings. Remember, they got they had wiretappings in the car because they said that Maria was involuntarily coerced to do this and that Dora was involuntarily coerced to make the statements. And that's what incriminated her. And this violated the Miranda warnings. They wanted a court appointed translator for Maria and they wanted to have all of them tried separately. And then Danielle's defense said that his constitutional rights were violated when he made his statements. They also said that when um, Danielle met with Maria after Joey's death, apparently it was recorded and they said that was recorded without his knowledge. So they just wanted to throw that out. They again asked on October 27th for the venue to be changed outside of Brownsville because it was getting too much publicity and it would be beyond difficult to select an impartial jury. Also, prosecutors had presented evidence to a second grand jury and issued a revised indictment. So to them, they said there was a clear distinction between the first indictment and the second indictment. And basically, if you look right here, I'll show you the clear distinction. It was the word, quote, caused to, quote, committed. That's it. So because of a new indictment, uh, everybody had to plead, well, didn't have to, but they chose to plead not guilty again for the second time. And this all happened when, so on November 2nd, this is when the judge was about to announce his decision about changing the venue. That's the same day that the grand jury was like, we're reindicting Dora and Maria. And then they all said they were not guilty again. And this all pushed the court proceedings back from the original date. So everything had to be reissued. So a pretrial hearing was then scheduled for November 2nd instead of October 7th. And so that obviously pushed the trial date back. So pretrial is a month late now, and I'm guessing the trial date is going to be a month late again. Like I said, they were filing everything, everything, everything. Guess how many motions were filed? Y'all wouldn't guess. Y'all would not be able to guess how many motions were filed. 40 
42. 42 motions were filed. This is complete BS. On November 23rd, Dora's request to change the venue was denied by the court based on the fact that the prosecution said that they can get a bunch of people, a bunch of jurors together from other parts of Cameron County and not just Brownville. So Dora, suck it and we're gonna have the trial right here. And like I said, the trial was pushed back and it was more than a month. So now it's pushed back to January 31st, 1994. And on that same day, that's when Maria decided to admit that, yes, she indeed conspired to kill Joey. And she agreed to testify against Dora and Danielle. And with this agreement, what she was trying to get was she was trying to get her capital murder, murder charges dropped and for her sentence to be changed to conspiracy instead. So the judge was like, mm, eh, well, let me put it this way. I'm not bound by this plea bargain. It could, it couldn't, eh, maybe. But you know, you have the right to drop your guilty plea if you want to. So on February 1st, Maria decided to change her plea to guilty to conspiracy to murder and agreed to testify, sing like a bird, for the prosecution against Dora and Danielle. So jury selection started on February 4th, and it took until February 23rd to be able to select 11 jurors. So the trial began on February 25th, 1994, and basically everything that we talked about here was was presented in the trial. People flipped sides, people were testifying against each other, people were singing like birds. Um, Danielle's half-brother testified against him and said that uh, Danielle had admitted that he received $3,000 for Joey's murder. So everybody's telling on everybody here. They did allow the voice recordings in there. So they had the voice recordings. The jurors were able to listen to the voice recordings and they were able to read the transcripts. Maria had ended up testifying against Dora, told, uh, told the jury everything that happened with Dora because, you know, she changed her plea deal. So she was singing, singing like a canary. And for her, she actually had to speak to the jury through a Spanish interpreter. So nobody could say that she didn't understand what was going on. No, people didn't understand her. She had her own interpreter. There was also a recording with Maria, with uh, Dora, Maria and Dora. And so the recording, they were able to hear this, quote, there isn't, isn't any evidence that I did anything, end quote. So remember, I said that in the, in like in the middle of this episode. So they were able to actually hear Dora say this. And Maria said that Dora actually told her that the plan was a secret and that she wanted Joey, quote, good and dead. She also pointed directly at Dora, that woman there. I don't know how to say that in Spanish. Let's see. La mujer allá. <laughs> I don't know if that's how you say it. But, you know, this is what she said in court and pointed at Dora. That's the woman there who wanted Joey dead. The defense attorney's strategy was to discredit Maria. So they were saying her testimony was wrong. It's lies. She's a con woman. And to show that she was a con woman, they showed letters from a lot of her former clients who paid her like, say, like around $600 for love potions. And of course, you know, the love potions didn't work. So one woman from San Antonio said that she had spoken with Maria when she began having problems with her boyfriend. And Maria said, you know, pay me $600. I'll give you this this potion and this will work. This is what she said. And obviously it didn't work. So she was complaining about her and they, they brought up a bunch of other people. So, you know, they asked Maria about this. So Maria was like, I, I don't, I don't know these people. I have no idea what they're talking about. I've never done this. I'm an honest woman. And they were like, Oh, okay. Well, uh, the exhibit A and showed the letters that came from her for, former clients. And then they started reading it actually in court. And then she was like, Oh, ho, ho, ho those letters, those clients. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I know them, but you know, I used herbs, oils, and what she says was holy water in my sessions. And I told them that if it's supposed to work, it's going to work. I didn't really tell them it was going to work. It was up to their interpretation. And she also kept a human skull in her shop, a human skull. Why? But 
Anyways, so then on March 7th, after eight days of trial, I thought it would be longer than that, but the trial only lasted eight days. They had their closing statement. Closing statement lasted about three hours. And in the closing statements, they presented three witnesses, three more witnesses, and then rested their case. So once all that was done, the judge told the prosecutors that they had two choices. They could either choose to charge the defendants with capital murder, or they could choose to charge them with conspiracy to commit murder. And the prosecution decided to choose capital murder. And they sought the death penalty for Dora and Danielle. The next day, the jury convicted Dora and Danielle of capital murder for arranging Joey's death. On March 9th, the judge sentenced both Dora and Danielle to life in prison because the jury decided that neither of them actually posed a threat to society. So they ended up getting life in prison with a possibility of parole after 35 years behind bars. On March 25th, Maria was sentenced to 20 years in, pit in prison for conspiracy to commit murder. And that was actually the maximum sentence for her. The shortest sentence would have been two years. So she got the maximum sentence, 20 years. So her flipping on her friends and everything, well, not her friends, but her clients and everything, did her no favors. Nothing happened. She got nothing. He also said that she would be eligible for per parole in 18 to 24 months. However, and I guess this is their idea of, sh you know, she got something. They said if she hadn't have pled guilty, then she would have gotten the same sentence as Dora and Dan. Danielle. And then she would also be eligible for parole in 18 to 24 months because the murder weapon was, weapon was never found. That's what? If the murder weapon had been found, then the law in Texas requires that all individuals convicted in a murder case to serve at least a fourth of their sentence before being eligible for parole. So it would have affected her parole. On July 13th, 1995, Cameron County officials and state authorities went all the way to Mexico City to ask the Mexican officials down there to prosecute the two hitmen. And after, oh my gosh, so much paperwork and so many translator hours and everything like that on July 15th they agreed to prosecute both of them for the murder in an international prosecution court in Mexico. Now this part is interesting. The Texas prox prosecutors asked the Mexican government to use something called Article 4 of the Mexican Federal Penal Code which is something they really really don't use but it's a provision that permits Mexican citizens to be prosecuted in Mexico for crimes they committed outside of Mexico but in order for the provision to to take effect, it requires that the accused people to be in the Mexican territory and not to have faced any kind of justice in the country where the crime was committed and that the crime wasn't just illegal in the country that it was committed in, but it was also illegal in Mexico. So that checks all the boxes. Now, murder in Mexico carries a maximum sentence of 50 years in prison, but usually people are released after 15 to 25 years for good behavior. So on September 20th, the, the Mexican federal judge agreed to prosecute them both for the murder. And in the end, they were both found guilty and sentenced to 15 years in prison. That's it. Good Lord. Now you would think that's it, but... It's not. But wait, there's more. On January 25th, 1996, Dora's conviction was overturned by the Court of Appeals for the 13th District of Texas in Edinburgh, Texas. While they were in court, the judge instructed the jury that unless there was evidence showing that Dora employed the assassins or that there was evidence that the assassins killed Joey, she actually couldn't be convicted of capital murder. Wow. So of course the jury actually had no hard evidence. That was like no evidence actually except word of mouth that Dora hired the assassins since they only spoke with Maria remember so basically everything they had was circumstantial evidence just everything they had could have just been a coincidence like the car coming into Brownsville uh, the phone calls that were made to Dallas could have been all of this could have just been written off as one huge strange coincidence so they couldn't really write that down as hard evidence. So remember Dora kept asking Maria, making sure there was no evidence leading back to her? Like, oh my God. So even though the two assassins were behind bars, that was still not enough to show that Dora is the one who hired them. They did realize and recognize that 
they she did give the money to Maria, who then gave that to Daniel, but that meant there were just several other people who were at fault as well. So in order for the jury to find Dora responsible for another party's actions, so somebody else's actions, the judge needed to charge the jury on the Texas law of parties that she was, quote, acting a party to the offense. So prosecutors said, all right, so let's go ahead and do that. She is guilty under the law of parties and that she was guilty of the crime of murder, even though she didn't commit the crime directly. However... The bad thing is prosecutors didn't word the charge appropriately. The way they worded it was suggesting that Dora directly hired the assassins to murder Joey instead of the fact that she indirectly did it by hiring different people. So because of this small technicality, and I guess the lack of hard evidence, on February 14th, Dora was released on a $50,000 bond. The prosecution the prosecution didn't agree with the bill that was set forth, but they also failed to file the appropriate paperwork within the mandatory 10 days. So on February 22nd, she was actually let out of prison. Can you imagine being those parents, being that family? Can you imagine that? This case is just getting crazier and crazier and crazier. Whew, okay, we're not done with this telenovela. Now, after two years, Dora was rearrested again, which I guess that's what rearrested means, on February 25th, 1998, and this time she was held without bond. Also, this time she was arrested for the same murder for higher charges as the first time, but it was done by the FBI. And they said that normally, you know, people would think this is double jeopardy, but it's not because, like I said, she was arrested federally and not like she was arrested federally this time. So it's technically not double jeopardy. The FBI said she was indicted by a grand jury for using quote, interstate or foreign commerce facilities to orchestrate a murder. And then the indictment here, it was held only two weeks before the statute of limitations on, on the crime ran out. Can you imagine that? This time, if she was convicted, she was facing another life term in prison and $250,000 fine. So the defense for her, they said that she was going to plead not guilty and they wanted to go to trial. On March 2nd, the defense asked the court if Dora could be set free on bond during the trial because she didn't pose a flight risk as demonstrated by her actions in the first trial. They said that she never failed to appear in court. She never ran. And basically she wasn't a flight risk. So the court said, fine. And on March 9th, she was released from jail on a $300,000 bond. What is going on here? Oh my God. Even though they released her, they asked her to hand over her passport and to limit her travel and that she could only travel to Brownsville and also that her husband had to sign a document that made him a third party custodian. So he's basically responsible for her. On April 1st, her lawyers asked for the new trial to be moved outside of Brownsville like they were trying to do before, claiming that Dora had received unfair treatment in, in the media during the first trial and since then. So on May 4th, the judge agreed and the trial was moved from, Br from Brownsville to Houston. So in their opening statement, the defense denied that Dora had anything to do with the murder, called Maria a liar, and said you could, there's clear evidence or lack thereof that Dora did anything. Then my question is, my question to her, I would ask her to her face, well, why would Maria, who didn't even know Joey or, her, or his family, even want him dead then? The only person that knows Joey is you. They also had Joey's mother on the stand again. So imagine his parents had to relive this again. Ah, So they did the same thing that they did in the first trial. They brought forth all the same witnesses. They brought forth Maria, the mother, um, the recordings that were made in the car. They brought forth bank statements that showed that she did withdraw $5,000 from the family safety deposit box, both on July 7th, 92 and March 3rd, 93. That was actually the morning that Joey was killed. She went to her family safety deposit box. What's illegal about that? She took out $5,000. Yeah, but it was because the family was planning a trip to Mexico. And the prosecution was like, well, 
yeah, I guess we have no evidence to really show what she did with that money. They even got Daniel, even though he was in jail, they even spoke with him. Like they, they, they replayed the whole thing again. And, you know, Dora and her defense fought it. Then on May 12th, after three hours of deliberation, the federal jury convicted Dora of the murder. The defense, however, told the jurors that there was not enough evidence, again, they're saying this, to uphold the conviction under federal requirements of reasonable doubt. But the government concluded that it met the burden of proof of interstate or foreign commerce charges in two ways. First, through the phone calls from Mexico and through the license plate of the Mexican car that crossed into the U.S. and registered at the motel, and that that car matched the description of the vehicle seen at the murder scene. So then on July 27th, the jury came back with their final verdict and told Dora that, peace, you get life in prison. So now she's right back in prison. Ah. That was a journey. On February 24th, 2000, the United States Courts of Appeals decided to review the case. And then after reviewing it, they were like, yeah, yeah. On on January 4th, 2001, they were like, yeah, she, she stays where she is. And so they denied a petition to rehear the case. On April 4th, 2001, her defense filed another motion seeking a judicial court review. They wanted the U.S. Supreme Court to review her conviction and had it have it overturned. They claimed that the U.S. federal government did not have jurisdiction over her case because there was no evidence of foreign commerce to invoke federal jurisdiction. They said that the murder arrangements were actually made in Texas and that the murderers traveled from Dallas to Brownville not Mexico, before the murder. On October 3rd, the Fifth Circuit said, yeah, we don't have time for this. We have other cases to go through, other appeals to consider, so we don't have time for this. And they denied, the U.S. Supreme Court denied her request for an appeal on November 10th, 2008. You would think after all of this, it would be done, right? But you would be wrong. On February 22nd, oh my gosh, she's really, really, really trying. But you know what? That's the personality she had. Because when Joey left her daughter, this is exactly the same thing she was doing. So I shouldn't be surprised. On February 22nd, 2021, yes, last year, Dora filed a motion with the U.S. District Judge seeking a reduction of her sentence due to medical complications. She wrote that she should never have received more than 20 years for the crime she committed and requested a uh, a reduction in her sentence. She also requested that the court appoint her legal counsel. Wait a second. She said that she was innocent. So why is she now writing that she committed a crime? Because she wrote, quote, she should not have received more than 20 years for the crime she committed. Wasn't her whole thing was that she was innocent? Quote, I am writing the courts to ask that you please accept this as a motion under 18 U.S.C. 3582. I have filed all the remedies. I suffer from neurocognitive disorder, thyroid arthritis, high cholesterol, also being treated for dementia. I am unable to care for myself. I do believe that I should have that I should not have gotten more than 20 years for my crime. I have been locked up for almost 30 years. I ask the courts at this time to appoint me counsel as I am uneducated in the legal field, as I am getting help from another inmate with this motion, end quote. So the judge was like, oh man, you suffer from neurocognitive disorder, thyroid arthritis, high cholesterol, and dementia? Oh, I am so sorry for you. You know what Joey suffers from? death. So yeah, you can stay there. So motion denied. On March 2021, he denied her request, writing, quote, Defendant Dora Dora Garcia Cisneros requests for a compassionate release under 18 U.S.C. 3582 is denied without prejudice and ordered that Defendant Dora Garcia Cisneros request for appointment of counsel is denied, end quote. So, oh my God, that I could finally say is the case of Dora Cisneros. Dora's in jail. Maria Martinez is in jail. The two hitmen are in jail. Daniel is in jail. And poor Joey is dead. What in the world do y'all think about this episode? (laughs) Oh my God. Let me know in the comments below. Uh, Was this a telenovela or what? 
this had so many ups, downs, left, rights, just coming and going. I just, I couldn't even follow the amount of names in this case and, and how many people were involved. I really wish Char was here because this would have been insane for the both of us to do. So let me know what y'all thought about this insanity in the comments below. Before we wrap up today, I want to remind y'all that the countdown for the end of this summer sale is starting today. So 10 days from today, summer sale is over. $5 secret tier where you get everything, access to everything will be gone. It'll go back up to $10. I want to give a shout out to some of the people who joined. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Second Stacy. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Tori. And thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your donations. It really means the world to us that you believe in us and that you're spending your hard-earned money on us. You get the bonus episodes, you get the commercial free episodes, you get all of that behind the scenes. If you, the listeners right now, want to be part of that, then go ahead and visit us at www.patreon.com forward slash love and murder and choose much thanks secret tier. Again, you could just click on the link below. It takes you right to the tier and go ahead and subscribe that way. Follow us on social media at facebook.com forward slash relationship crime instagram at love murder podcast join our facebook fan group by searching love and murder fan page in google or facebook or by simply clicking the link in the show notes below find our awesome merch by going to our website www.murderandlove.com and clicking on our shop in the menu above and you're going to have sing like a bird merch in there this week and an easy and free way to help us out is by simply sharing this episode. So just click on that share an icon and share with your friends, your family, and as many people as was in this case, that's as many people as I challenge you to share this episode with. <laughs> Hopefully, Shar will be back soon. Go to our Facebook fan group and, you know, tell her I hope you get better soon. We were, we're rooting for you. We're looking for you. We can't wait for you to be back. Hopefully, hopefully she'll be back by next week's episode. And also, I just want to ask y'all to go ahead and give us a five-star rating on the platform of your choice. You could do it on Apple Podcasts. You could do it on Spotify. You could do it in Good Pods, wherever. If you would just go and give us a five-star rating, that would be amazing. And I'm doing amazing in sign language. Amazing. That's all we have. And as I remind you, don't be a telenovela like this one. Don't be like Maria. Don't be like Dora. Don't be like all of them. If your child breaks up with someone or divorces them, just let it go. It's not your business. And always remember, it's all love and no murder, y'all. <laughs>